Welcome everyone to Aspen Brain Institute's Expert Speaker Series 2.0. Welcome to our growing community of global seekers who seek to be educated and delighted at the cutting edge. Um, hello to people all over the US and to 103 countries, all who have registered for this series. Thank you all for tuning in. We are offering this a new series, free series, in order to build an online global community focused solely on brain health. Uh, we'd like to thank Lugano Diamonds for their generous support as our national underwriter. And we thank Lugano Diamonds for choosing Aspen Brain Institute as a nonprofit worthy of their support and their values. Also for, um, we thank them for making our Zoom expert series free to the public and able to be viewed free worldwide. So thank you again. We also thank Alpine Bank for their generous sponsorship over the many years now. They're the best community bank in Aspen. And thanks to our partners at Brain Futures and they're doing important work in advancing the practical application of new scientific understanding of the brain and learning. Now at our expert series 2.0, you will hear global thinkers, uh, global leaders, technology experts, cutting edge scientists, top notch doctors and extraordinary creatives. We hope that their insights will transform how you care for your brain today that your 90 year old brain will thank you for tomorrow. We at Aspen Brain Institute are on a mission. And our mission is to create a brain healthy planet. Uh, and we'll do this by sharing access to the top minds and best evidence-based research on brain health and by increasing brain health literacy worldwide. It is now my honor and privilege to bring you these new episodes Let's see what we can learn and explore together. Now to our expert series. I wanna introduce our moderator for today, Emily Gold Mears. Emily, trained as a lawyer and esteemed member of the Aspen Brain Institute Board of Directors, is now directing her passion for innovative medical and scientific research toward finishing her first book, which she calls The Science of Optimal Health and High Performance, which is coming out in 2021. This is gonna be a fascinating discussion. Emily, take it away. So I would like to introduce you to Rachel Yehuda, our speaker today. She's the director of the Center for the Study of Psychedelic Psychotherapy and Trauma, vice chair for veteran affairs for the psychiatry department, and a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, as well as the director of mental health at the Bronx Veterans Affairs Medical Center and the director of the Traumatic Stress Studies Division. Throughout her career, her research has focused on the study of the enduring effects of trauma exposure, particularly PTSD, as well as associations between biological and psychological measures. She has investigated novel treatment approaches for PTSD and the biological factors that may contribute to differing treatment outcomes for the purpose of developing personalized medicine strategies for treatment matching in PTSD. She has authored more than 450 published papers, chapters, and books in the field of trauma and resilience, focusing on topics such as PTSD prevention and treatment, molecular biomarkers of stress, vulnerability, and resilience, and intergenerational effects of trauma and PTSD. I hope you'll agree that she is the definitive expert in many aspects of PTSD. I'm excited to have her with us today. It is my honor to introduce all of you to Dr. Yehuda. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. If anyone would have told me even two years ago that I would be speaking about psychedelics at the Aspen Brain Institute, I would have had a laugh because I do generally 
get asked to talk about things like epigenetics and intergenerational uh, effects of trauma, the biology and treatment of PTSD, and similar work like you just mentioned that we've done in the field of trauma. But in the last year, I've joined a growing group of researchers around the world who are examining the potential therapeutic effects of psychedelics in mental health for conditions like PTSD and depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. And today, I'd like to share my perspective about the pivotal opportunity that psychedelics present for patients with mental health conditions and for scientists who are seeking to understand the underlying mechanisms of recovery and resilience. I'm excited about the potential for psychedelics, not only because so many of our patients uh, stand to benefit from them, but because their very adoption stands to revolutionize how mental health is conceptualized and delivered. And I think we need a revolution in mental health care. What we currently do for patients with the conditions that I just mentioned is pretty much try to keep them in treatment for as long as possible. Uh, we often prescribe daily medications that are taken for years and sometimes even decades, even though these medications can have side effects like sexual dysfunction and weight gain. We offer psychotherapy in hourly increments, uh, weekly, monthly, or as needed during a time of crisis. Many times the psychiatrist prescribing the medicine isn't the same person as it's doing the psychotherapy. But most important is that we try to make sure that our patients don't get worse or that they, or that they don't fall off of our radar. But it is a fact that current treatments um, leave at least a third of our patients with severe symptoms and very rarely result in remission. And this might be why we're so satisfied with small incremental improvements, but the escalating rate of suicide in our country suggests that there is a profound inability to deliver, at least um, for many people, the kind of treatments that they need and that they deserve. But psychedelics offer a novel model of treatment that might lead to large improvements in a relatively short period of time. Psychedelic drugs promote a change in a normal state of consciousness, often by heightening the senses. And this causes people to experience themselves in the world differently. And the psychologist Stanislav Grof said about psychedelics that when used responsibly, they can be to the field of psychiatry what the microscope is for biology or the telescope is for astronomy. And I think that's a really good description uh, because in the altered state produced by psychedelics, people can see things that perhaps they would not otherwise see. And once those things are seen, it isn't necessary to keep taking the psychedelic. As the philosopher Alan Watts put it, if you get the message, you can hang up the phone. The biologist doesn't work with their eye glued to the microscope, she goes away and works with what she has seen. So it is this work of understanding and integrating the psychedelic experience that leads people to make really big changes in their lives. And these changes can result in dramatic improvements in their symptoms. Now you might be listening to this, if you are listening to this, and you think this sounds too, too good to be true, there's no quick remedy for uh, mental health conditions, particularly chronic ones, then you are having the exact same reaction that I had when I first heard about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So I want to share with you how I went from skeptic to participant in really this global renaissance of psychedelic research. And I think that this is a really important conversation because there's still so many people, clinicians, important policymakers in mental health um, that are still concerned about the use of psychedelics. And the reason that I know this <clears throat> is because I'm running into so many of them as I try to pursue this work. <clears throat> A lot of the concern is the result of the lingering effects of government policies that were instituted in the late 60s and 70s that are long overdue for reexamination. These policies were made without considering the therapeutic legacy of psychedelics, and there is a legacy. Prior to the 60s, psychedelic drugs like LSD were being studied in uh, mental health for the potential effects of accelerating gains in therapy. These studies were uh, funded by 
the government. MDMA was used by hundreds of therapists to help patients um, feel more open and promote greater self-awareness. And for thousands of years before that, uh, psychedelic medicines extracted from plants like mescaline and ayahuasca and psilocybin had been used by shamans in indigenous cultures as part of healing rituals and spiritual journeying. But in the 60s, the government began designating psychedelics as having high risk for harm with no medical benefit. And today we call this a Schedule I classification. And after that, the government stopped funding research into the potential effectiveness of psychedelics as therapeutic agents. With a little more time, there might have been compelling evidence for the efficacy of psychedelics to support a less restrictive category, like a Schedule II that is used for opiates and amphetamines, which are not illegal drugs, but simply restricted. Uh, but there were political considerations that made it seem like an emergency uh, for the government to take quick action. And we see this even today, uh, sometimes political considerations against Trump scientific data. Psychedelics were made illegal because the establishment saw a connection between the recreational use of psychedelics and the counterculture's rejection of their values and particularly as expressed by the anti-Vietnam War protests. And the establishment absolutely had a point because it's hard to think about violence and going to war after you undergo an experience that fosters love and connection to others, to nature and to the universe. Although the government stopped funding clinical research examining the usefulness of psychedelics, it did start funding science on the negative consequences of psychedelics when abused or when given to animals in extremely high doses. And this led to a really big concern in the scientific community that psychedelics may have neurotoxic effects, particularly with respect to serotonin brain neurons. I remember a commercial that aired frequently when I was growing up. It showed an egg. This is your brain. Then the egg was cracked and put in a sizzling frying pan. This is your brain on drugs. And the message was really clear and really effective. And most of us didn't even realize that it was based on oversimplified and sensationalized interpretations of the science because our message was so perfect. The effects of this message are still with many of us today because today, if you Google the term psychedelic drug, mainstream authoritative dictionaries like Webb's Webster or Oxford or Botanica will define these drugs as drugs that produce psychotic states or perceptual distortions and hallucinations or altered perception but with diminished control over what is being experienced. And these definitions are scary and they perpetuate negative ideas about psychedelics in mainstream psychiatry, in medicine, and in the general public because Let's face it, many people think that if these drugs are illegal, there must be a reason. But the narrative that psychedelics are dangerous results from a failure to distinguish between the effects of a trusted compound used in the hands of a trained therapist in the context of a therapeutic process and adverse effects that can occur when a drug is used in an unmonitored setting and at the wrong dose, not to mention that perhaps the drug causing the negative reaction isn't even the drug you think it is because it is cut with something that is dangerous. But it is the failure to make that distinction that has deprived mental health patients of potential solutions. But the good news is that things seem to be uh, changing now. The FDA has designated uh, two breakthrough treatments, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and psilocybin for depression. And this means that pending the results of phase three trials, the FDA could approve these treatments for clinical use. Now, the government is still not funding clinical trials of psychedelics or any science supporting its use. So far, funding for this work has come from private philanthropists and investors and they're important heroes in this story because this work has now resulted in a very different feeling as people like myself start to realize that we've been laboring under some really bad assumptions about psychedelic use. And indeed, I am often still asked, what is driving me, a person who has been so rooted in mainstream academic psychiatry research and conservative healthcare systems, 
to do research in these compounds. And I'll answer that now. At least a part of that story has to do with the fact that about a decade ago, I became progressively concerned that the field of trauma had headed into a dead end with respect to PTSD treatment. PTSD is a very serious problem and, develop, and develops following trauma in about 10% of people with a higher prevalence among people who have actually been exposed to trauma. So there's a 30% rate among combat veterans and a nearly 50% of rape, rape victims have PTSD. And the most common thing that I've heard people with PTSD say is that I'm not the same person that I used to be. And indeed, PTSD really changes the way that you look at the world and yourself. People with PTSD are haunted by memories of what happened and by nightmares. Traumatic memories bring back the fear and the helplessness and the horror and a lot of the fight or flight uh, that was experienced when the trauma was happening. And this causes trauma survivors to really try to avoid any reminders of the trauma. And they often restrict their lives and become emotionally numb, certainly to positive emotions. They see the potential for danger everywhere and are constantly on alert, kind of like on survival mode, and they can't sleep or concentrate. Now, PTSD patients do experience emotions. They experience extreme anger and shame and guilt. And after a while, this kind of negative view of themselves in the world becomes an immutable narrative and they just get stuck in it. As an academic, um, I do a lot of speaking and teaching, but a few years ago, I just couldn't steal myself to give talks about treating PTSD. And I found myself uh, less than willing to tout evidence-based gold, gold standard therapies because I felt that their effects were minimal and also not long lasting. And I really wanted to call my field to arms and get my colleagues to acknowledge that our current approaches weren't providing the kind of healing that our patients really needed. And by this time, I had had many leadership roles, uh, developing treatment programs for PTSD at the VA and for civilians at Mount Sinai, including clinics for very traumatized groups like Holocaust survivors and 9-11 survivors and victims of childhood abuse. My team had conducted numerous clinical trials examining the efficacy of various PTSD treatments, including experimental ones. Our group had also developed state-of-the-art biomarkers to try to examine mechanisms of recovery by looking at brain images and epigenetics and hormones and neurochemicals. And we were poised to examine biologic mechanisms of resilience following treatment. But it was difficult to identify them because even the gold standard treatments in PTSD weren't powerful enough to generate enough people that could tolerate the treatment or achieve the kind of recovery that we needed. So we were in a way all dressed up with wonderful scientific technology and methods, but nowhere to go in terms of the kind of treatment signal that would help us identify the biologic changes that occur when people with PTSD actually get better. Now, many professionals will tell you that PTSD is one of the hardest mental health conditions to treat. Conventional medicines, even the FDA approved antidepressants they don't fully work because they just blunt symptoms. But healing from trauma involves confronting what happens. But there's a big catch-22 here. If, uh, talking about the trauma, even with a therapist, uh, can often be re-traumatizing. And that's why many PTSD patients will avoid talking about the trauma, even with their therapist. And many of them will avoid coming to therapy, um, and some will drop out. Now, the prevailing idea is that if you can get someone to become desensitized to their own narrative by having, by having them repeat over and over again what happened, they won't be as reactivated by the memory of their past experiences. And this is sometimes called habituation or fear extinction. And people in my field talk about this a lot. Now, this kind of approach, it can work particularly in people who are able and willing to fully disclose details of what happened to them without hiding important aspects of it from the therapist or for themselves. 
Conventional PTSD treatments can also work if there aren't a lot of complicating other factors like suicide behavior or brain injury or substance abuse or ongoing stressors, but many patients have those things. Cognitive behavioral treatments will work less well in the context of multiple or chronic trauma, or what we call complex trauma, or when the trauma is not that well defined or if it created a moral conflict, such as in the situation of combat, when one is the hunter and the hunted. Some traumas are just confusing because they're a composite of bad things that happen, but also good ones. Combat experiences can be brutal and some decisions that were made agonizing, but there's also camaraderie and patriotism and service and many positive accomplishments. It's the worst of times, but sometimes it's also the best of times. And with repeated sexual abuse in childhood, um, the victim often receives love and attention along with the abuse. Trauma is so much more complicated and multifaceted than it seems. And it's often ineffable, which is a word used to describe psychedelic journeys. Some say that trauma is unspeakable, but without words to describe the trauma, conventional therapies will fall short. When people do heal from trauma, it's often because they figure out how to construct a new narrative what about what happened to them and what it means. They see things in a different light. This occurs when the trauma survivor can reflect on the trauma without being flooded by the usual feelings of fear, shame, guilt, and self-recrimination that can really obscure their own understanding of their experience. And also if the fight or flight response can be quieted down a little bit. In PTSD, there are brain changes as that can ramp up the body's resistance to confronting the trauma and changing perspective. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD can actually really help with these particular problems because the psychedelic allows people to mute the normal self-critical voice inside their head. It also helps get them out of survival mode. And that allows people to peer inside that microscope and get a very different perspective and see their trauma differently. I think that MDMA is particularly helpful in PTSD for three reasons. MDMA promotes feelings of empathy, self-compassion and connection to others, um, emotions that are generally unavailable to the PTSD patient. MDMA seems to make unpleasant memories less disturbing by suppressing activity in the amygdala or fear centers in the brain. And since the amygdala has been found to be overactive in trauma survivors who are reliving a traumatic memory, this feature of MDMA may be a very important reason why this works during a session. MDMA also increases introspection and trust though, and this allows patients to really work with their therapists doing trauma-focused therapy. And studies have shown that after three sessions of MDMA and about nine short or 90 minute integration sessions, patients who have tried and failed other treatment methods will show an average decline of 50 points on a PTSD severity scale. And I want to really give you an understanding um, of how to put that in perspective. Cognitive behavioral therapy trials will deem a patient to have had a clinically meaningful response with just a 12 point decline in symptoms over the kind of the same period of time. And since most patients st start out with a score of like 70 or 80, a 12 point decline doesn't actually make a huge difference in their lives even if it can yield a statistically significant change in symptoms, but a 50 point decline, that is a game changer. And even months after the treatment is finished, uh, two thirds of patients no longer have PTSD. They seem happy with their lives and their relationships. The one thing that people with, um, who experience trauma know is that the world can change very quickly we all know that now because we have lived through a global pandemic. Um, but the fact that things can change quickly can be harnessed to an advantage. Because just as the experience of trauma can be a watershed that so quickly shatters and negatively impacts someone's life, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy can yield a defining corrective experience 
that is no less consequential and capable of eliciting a reorganized narrative about oneself that can actually lead to a very big change. There's still a lot of work to do in this very new field of psychedelic psychotherapy. Um, and I'm gonna mention three of the things that I think are really important. First, I think it's important to examine psychedelic medicines in the most vulnerable populations in traditional healthcare settings and community settings and in VAs. But while we're doing that, it's important to think about the kind of therapeutic environment that we may need to create that will allow people to derive the full benefit of psychedelics. People talk a lot about the importance of set and setting when they talk about psychedelics. Set is the intention, uh, the difference between a recreational intention, for example, and a therapeutic intention, which we talked about earlier. But setting refers to where where, you're physic where you are physically taking the drug and with whom. Um, so taking it with a therapist, that's good, but what is your environment like? Is it cozy? Does it have pretty things to look at? Is it in nature? Is it with music? And I think we're gonna really have to think about um, our clinical environments and whether they're conducive to the kind of work that we need to do with psychedelics to achieve healing. I think the second really important thing is that we're gonna to have to start thinking about how we're gonna train the next generation of mental health providers so that they can work with psychedelics in their practice and how we're gonna introduce this kind of work in medical schools and in residencies and how we're gonna create fellowships, how we're gonna um, teach this in psychology programs and postdoctoral um, fellowships in psychology. Finally, it's critical to apply the scientific tools that we've worked so hard to develop over the last few years um, towards an understanding of a science, um, of, towards a new science that will help us understand mechanisms of recovery with psychedelic drugs. Because in order to revolutionize mental health, we need to replace the science of what can go wrong when psychedelics are used inappropriately with what goes right when they're used therapeutically. Look, medical science can be very slow to accept even FDA approved treatments without understanding how they work, what are their biologic targets, and what are their mechanisms of action. And the important science here may not even be the pharmacology or what happens to your brain while under the influence of psychedelic drugs but rather the science of how critical brain networks and epigenetic programs become transformed and reorganized by the experience of psychedelic psychotherapy. Really, it's the science of integration that we need to study. It's the science of really that, it's the science that will really help us explain how a single event, psychedelic psychotherapy, will galvanizes a process of healing and post-traumatic growth but in a sense, this is so similar to the predicament that our field was in when we had to start figuring out how a traumatic experience, something that happened well in the past, could continue to catalyze a process that resulted in chronic PTSD symptoms. And we had to get away from the idea that the answers would be in the fight or flight response and go for very different mechanisms that really explained how a single experience initiates a longer cascade of epigenetic effects that result in a more profound and enduring change. So it's really a very similar question that is being asked from a different angle. So I've made a commitment to psychedelic research. I actually think it's a moral imperative to consider anything that will bring healing to people who need it. And I think we're so well poised to understand the neuroscience behind it. And understanding this neuroscience, I think, will allow psychedelics to be ratified and institutionalized in mainstream healthcare and society even more quickly. I also actually consider it a privilege to be here now at this moment when it looks like things can really start changing for people who suffer from trauma and other mental health conditions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Yehuda. That was so interesting. And I have many, many questions as I'm sure our audience has. 
I wanted to start with, I feel as though I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the year 2020, because I recall reading in your research, you state that cataclysmic events trigger trauma. And I think we all agree that 2020, with the pandemic, with the global economic downturn, with the civil unrest, all occurring at the same time, certainly amount to at least one cataclysmic event, if not several. And I'm wondering what your insight is on the long-term mental health consequences of people today and subsequent generations. Well, <laughs> that's a really very interesting and good question. Um, and I think that we have to worry about the effects of trauma on our population today so that we can prevent this having an impact in subsequent generations. I think that that's really key. Um, so we have to provide mental health now to people who are suffering and we have to give people hope that they have the tools to be able to get through what is really a difficult period. I think a lot of times it's the helplessness that leads to um, trauma related responses. And so by developing resilience enhancing tools, we might be able to prevent a spread of this particular um, mental, the mental health effects of this pandemic um, going forward. We really need a recovery. Hopefully that is true. You talk about the mechanisms of healing, in particular suppressing the amygdala, which is overactivated in patients with PTSD. I'm wondering how the treatment affects both the prefrontal cortex as well as the hippocampus where we store memories. Are good memories altered along with the bad memories? So research um, using psychedelics um, is just getting started. And I don't think too many people have looked at the effects of psychedelics in, um, on brain function in people with PTSD. And that's an important thing to be able to do. I think there's just been one initial uh, study in that area. So I think that's gonna be an important frontier to see whether or not the psychedelic is actually gonna have an impact on memory. But I just wanna uh, clarify that the amygdala is overactivated, not always and all the time in people with PTSD, but particularly in the context of them remembering and re-experiencing their traumatic memory. So I think the more we can get people to kind of focus um, on more positive uh, healing experiences, maybe we can turn that around as well. Because when people see that they can suppress their amygdala, then they don't feel as stuck in this idea that they can't do anything to prevent their internal state. So a healing experience that actually allows them to dampen it down for a little while can be extremely, um, extremely eye-opening for them. I see, okay. Um, I'm wondering, are there any positive adaptations from experiencing overwhelming stress? For instance, one may respond by increasing their resiliency and their ability to deal with adversity that may not be present in those who never experience stressful situations. Oh, I... I'm a total believer in that. And I think that one of the things um, that you don't need to have a psychedelic experience to have post-traumatic growth. I think that it really helps catalyze the process. It can take a very long time for a trauma survivor to sort of reach a perspective that as a result of their trauma experience, this just puts them in a position to do things that they would not have otherwise done. Sometimes I call this being the podium of suffering. Uh, people who have experienced extreme trauma are in an unparalleled position to help other people who are similarly going through that trauma or to understand what might be helpful for them. Um, many trauma survivors uh, turn their PTSD around and even alongside with their PTSD, really seek to make things better for other people. And this could be a very important part of their healing. I think that resilience is um, something that you come to have after you've been traumatized. It's not a muscle that you need until you're really um, challenged. So I think the experience of going through a really dark time um, 
can be very, very transformative. And people who have come out the other end will say this. I have heard it many, many times. And there are so many examples of ways that people begin to feel better, um, begin to feel like they can reclaim their lives, that they don't have to continually worry about being harmed, um, can, uh, you know, turn that around and help other people. Interesting. Okay, what about the unintended consequences of this treatment? It seems as though our biology is so very complex. And I wonder if we begin manipulate, manipulating certain aspects like our neurotransmitters, how are we affecting the rest of our biology? For example, if MDMA boosts serotonin, is it possible that we may inadvertently thwart our endogenous production of this and other MDMA affected neurotransmitters and then become dependent upon this treatment for the production of these, these vital neurotransmitters? Sure, you could be asking that question about um, antidepressant drugs in general, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are taken daily for years, <laughs> sometimes for even longer than that. Um, MDMA is short acting. Half-life is about seven hours. So mm -hmm. it is true that there might be serotonin depletion. Um, there, there's a very big rush of serotonin uh, as a result of taking MDMA. Uh, but, if, but the therapeutic use of MDMA really involves taking it once, um, doing um, several integration sessions, maybe several weeks later taking it again, doing a few more integration sessions over the following weeks, then taking it a third time. And this would be over a three month period. And that's it. That's uh, pretty much a course of treatment that is recommended. So it doesn't have with it the same kind of um, um, toxicology profile or uh, concern of permanently depleting serotonin. And again, that's um, some of the problems with the over-sensationalized um, view of this is your brain on drugs is that yes, you can take um, a, a, an fMRI or a PET scan and somebody who is either you or somebody who has recently used drugs or is using them now can look like a lot of things light up. And our response to that can be, ooh, look at this, something great must be happening. Or it could be, oh my goodness, something terrible is happening. But it's temporary. <laughs> and so um, that is really the key. The key is um, whether or not there's going to be permanent um, or chronic or long-term damage. And um, you know, there hasn't been any evidence to suggest that when psychedelics are taken therapeutically, um, there is evidence of this kind of damage or um, neurotoxicity or problems. So again, any compound that we take can be dangerous if it's not taken in the right way. This is a fact. This is why so many of our compounds are prescribed by people that are knowledgeable. Um, and that's really one of the very important challenges of medicine that you have to be in a position to understand um, inter drug interactions and so many other variables. But even benign things that we can buy like aspirin can be dangerous to us if we don't take them the right way. Psychedelics, from what I have come to learn in my short time in the field, actually seem like some of the more safer types of medications uh, compared to some other ones that you really have to worry about. Um, again, sometimes the field makes mistakes in not thinking something is dangerous when it is or thinking something is dangerous when it's not. But we need to keep an open mind and continue to revisit the data uh, so that we get this right. It's really important. Interesting. So you talk about the, the long-term co potential consequences of toxicity. Toxicity is un unknown. What about the long-term positive effects? You talk about three different treatments. How, how long have you been tracking the participants to determine how long the beneficial effects last? Uh, just to be very clear, we haven't done any of these studies um, yet. I am referring to data that have been 
sponsored by MAPS in connection with their phase two trials. And so this is in the literature. And in terms of their follow-ups, it seems that patients that have been treated with MDMA not only remain uh, with their gains in terms of their symptom improvement, but many of them continue to process traumatic memories um, thereafter. Um, the process of integration keeps going on because again, once you see something in a different way, your mind will start to make many connections and you'll set yourself off on a path of healing uh, if, especially if you have a therapist to discuss it with, and even some people um, leave therapy, but are still continuously thinking about and making treatment gains, because it's not a medication effect. It's an effect about changing your mind about something. The mm -hmm. psychedelic helped put you in a state where you could see something that you would not have otherwise seen. That's why I think that that... Um, analogy to a microscope in biology or a telescope in astronomy is so good. You really have to see it and then work with it. But once you know something, you know it. You're not depending on a medication to change your state. You are changing your knowledge base. And that is really what I think the um, revolution here is, that you change a state to help a process along because someone has been stuck. And this helps unstick them potentially. And this is what's going to lead to the treatment gain. And that's why I think it's gonna be a revolution because a lot of times we think about mental disorders like we think about diabetes, you know, just <laughs> to take that insulin when you need it. It's a chronic condition and you're going to, or, or a hormone replacement uh, because we have to make sure your brain chemistry is leveled up. This is a different model than that. Um, maybe in some conditions where the problem is that the brain chemistry needs to be eaten, uh, leveled off, maybe the uh, conventional treatments work. But for trauma, I think the problem is people are stuck in a narrative about themselves and the world that is just feeding back in this loop of more avoidance and more being overstimulated, more kind of worried about bad things happening, uh, recriminations, feeling bad about themselves, feeling that they need to restrict themselves from other people. And that is a cognitive process. So they were right in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy being the right idea. That's correct, the theory is correct. But in practice, it's just hard to do because there's so much going on and traumas are so complicated. And the process of just asking somebody to talk about their trauma without giving them a look into a microscope imposes a lot, not everyone can do it. So for those people who have tried and failed it, this is something new and something different. I see. Well, thank you for explaining that. I'm gonna ask you just one more of my own question before I turn to the audience questions. And my question is about how you discussed that we're in the midst of this revolution for mental health care treatment, which sounds terrific. But it seems though, one of the many steps that will be involved in having that revolution succeed is to really change the minds and transmit new information surrounding this. And I'm wondering if it seems as though one very effective way to do so is to share compelling personal stories and I don't know if the MAPS organization, because I know so little about them, if they are going to embark on documenting or chronicling individual personal stories of success to help change the minds of people whose minds need to be changed in order to facilitate this forward. Uh, I'm sure that, that uh, many people who have undergone this experience want to tell their story, but what I'm up to is just the need to continue right now to do this work. I think that it is very important to do clinical trials and, and try to reach people who have given up hope in terms of therapy. Um, for me right now, um, it's about science and about doing really rigorous clinical trials that also um, 
give us some insight into what might be happening because there might be a different way, there might be a shortcut way, there might be a scalable way, there might be a way of um, working a little bit different than, um, than uh, the initial experiences that people are having uh, with these compounds. So I think that I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how generalizable this is, whether it works in lots of different treatment settings, whether people um, can continue to show these strong and remarkable effects. And yeah, I think that um, there are many people who have um, talked about their personal experiences and documentaries are, are out there. Um, and I think that I've spoken to some of the people from the MAPS trial, and it has been unbelievably um, evocative and um, exciting that people that were stuck are now in a very, very different place. But I think we have to keep going because um, sometimes we're very quick to, to think something's a done deal when we're just at the beginning of it. And that's what, that's what I think. I think that getting the green light, you know, from the FDA to um, approve these medicines so that we can really be able to understand how to use them is a very, very, very important um, first milestone. And, oh, actually, I, I said I was going to go to the audience question, but I have one more because you just triggered a question. Um, I'm wondering if this MDMA, is it um, in the public domain? Does Big Pharma have any financial incentive to make money on this so that they can help with the legalization and the promoting of this? Yeah, that, that's not exactly something that, um, that's sort of not my table. I'm sure that there is... Um, a strategy uh, pending FDA approval. Um, I've tried to focus on really the science and why this is a good fit for people with PTSD. I believe the maps, 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 my, my, I think that, um, I think that it's okay for uh, people to think about making money on psych on treatments that work. I think that um, stimulating uh, interest in psychedelics, however it is achieved, is very important right now. But I don't really know all the things that are coming down the pike on that. Okay, so here's a question from our audience. Could you please lend some insight on the role of benefits of microdosing, taking a fractional amount oh, of psilocybin? I mean, I don't know if that's your area of expertise. It seems like MDMA has both a different outcome and effect on the brain. But this person is asking one day on, one day off, three days on, one day off. The research seems limited, but the anecdotal evidence suggests this may also have promising benefits. I think that the really important part of that question is that there are so many things that we only know anecdotally. Um, and when these drugs become legal, and even right now with FDA approved clinical trials, we can and should um, be asking these questions. So any question that you get that is in the vein of um, something that hasn't been formally studied because people have had their own experience and they're wondering about things like microdosing or they're wondering about com combining psychedelics, that's not in the literature yet. That's not available for us to know in terms of the channels that research takes. And so all of those things are really, really important to, um, to investigate scientifically. So I'm always fascinated when people tell me about their personal experience, because I think to myself, how to convert this into a research protocol so that it isn't just an anecdote, so that it is verifiable scientific evidence-based fact that can then be shared with confidence um, to a broader population. That's the responsible thing for someone like me to do. I see. So I have one more question, one more audience question before I'm going to turn it back to Glenda to wrap up the presentation. Um, and that has to do with the fact since traditional drug development has not seemed to work well for mental health. And this seems to have such promise. I suspect that there are a lot of 
underground therapists who are conducting these treatments. And I'm wondering how people who are anxious to try this are able to discern between a well-meaning, able underground therapist and a charlatan. That's the problem with having treatments that are underground. It's not, you know, the, the better solution would be to train mental health providers um, appropriately to credentialing and um, allow these treatments to become available in a very responsible way with the oversight that is needed um, so that they can take them. Until then, um, the second best option would be to look for a clinical trial um, that is studying the psychedelic that you're interested in having. Um, I know that there is an underground network, um, but it, I don't know how to answer that question of how would you know, because that's, that's exactly what the problem is. The problem is that people like me want to do the research that will help make this above board, not underground, so that we can really um, bring everything we can uh, to people without having to worry about charlatans or people that don't have the appropriate level of training just in psychiatry and psychology that might be needed to handle um, mental health uh, consequences. I see. Well, before I hand everything back to Glenda, I just wanted to thank you so much for your fascinating presentation and for your research and your contribution to the area of mental health. I want to thank our outstanding expert, Dr. Rachel Yehuda, and our moderator, Emily Goldmears, again, for the great discussion. Today was wonderful and so fascinating. And um, Dr. Yehuda, your passion for helping people in this manner with the healing powers of psychedelics and your new advocacy for this area of treatment is especially gratifying. Thank you for that. And thank you to the audience for getting educated and updated on many of the new aspects of brain health. Uh, thank you again to our sponsors, Lugano Diamonds and Alpine Bank, and to our friends at Brain Futures and the American Federation for Research on Aging. I wanna remind everyone that this session was, pre was recorded and will be available on our website, aspenbraininstitute.org in just a few days. Now this episode was our final episode in our uh, expert series 2.0. And I wanna close this expert series with some exciting news. Um, with the success of our free worldwide expert series, we've had at least 14 or 15,000 registrants signed up for this last series we decided to create a new series and it's a brand new five part series on brain healthy cooking. And it will be a free virtual series bringing together chefs and scientists. And it's our holiday gift to our growing uh, brain healthy community. It will start to air on November 10th and uh, weekly thereafter for five weeks. Please see our website for full details, all of the exciting chefs and scientists that will be coming to cook and have conversation with us. Um, please check our website to sign up for the first episode and you can sign up also at the same time for the whole series, if you'd like. Thanks everyone, we'll be seeing you in the Brain Health Kitchen and we'll get cooking. Ciao everyone. <laughs>